Have you ever been to Niagara Falls? I, I got to go a few years ago. It was amazing. Incredible. The three falls that make up Niagara Falls in between the United States and the Canadian border are amazing. There is an estimated close to, ready for this, 45 million gallons of water that go over every single minute. You know what it would take to kind of capture any of that into your... <laughs> you couldn't do it. I mean, I'd fill up this cup in one thousandth of a second. It, 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 it's next to impossible. And I think in, in many ways, that's the way God's love is like. Over the last few sessions, and I hope you've had an opportunity to watch them, I've been sharing about God's love. We've looked at God's love through the law. We've looked at it through Christ as he has been uh, shown throughout the scriptures and in the history. And then we have talked about the covenant. And today we're going to talk about bridging these two together and what it means for you personally, what it means for me. God cannot help but love. He can't do anything else. I mean, if he were to quit loving, he would quit being God. It's that simple. His love is as unstoppable as Niagara Falls. And I think that ought to be a significant hope to you and I today. Just as a reminder, go visit Isaiah just to reaffirm this truth, what I just told you. For the mountains may depart and the hills be removed, but my steadfast love shall not depart from you and my covenant of peace shall not be removed, says the Lord, who has compassion on you. And that's what the session's about. It, it really is about love that was pursuing you and me, and it wouldn't quit. How do you and I define love? I think the problem, one of our problems that we have with understanding this deep love is that we say, oh, I love the Knicks, or I love the Cowboys, or I, I love Green Bay, or I love hockey, I love this, and we... And we we rationalize love as in, in a simplistic form, where love at its core is deep, is very deep. It's eternally deep. And that's what we're going to talk about today. And I hope somehow that this just resonates with you and you see just how amazing God's love is towards you. But just focusing on the cross for a minute, I find it interesting that the cross has become such a, an identifying part of Christianity. You find it on necklaces, you find it on the exterior buildings, uh, on the interior buildings. Yet, the cross in Roman times was the most significant form of punishment. It was torturous. It was painful. Uh, Constantine finally put an end to it after 500 years of it being used. But none other than Cicero had some uh, very strong critiques about the crucifixion itself. It's a most cruel and disgusting punishment. I, I would agree with him. I can't think of a worse and more cruel punishment that could maybe be afflicted to, on a person than the cross. The victim would be put onto the cross, nailed by their feet, maybe nailed in their wrists, their hands, or even tied. They could last for days or even be gone as a few hours. What usually caused it is asphyxiation, heart attack, and it would just be brought on by prolonged suffering. The guards would have to wait the whole time. And, Sometimes they'd get frustrated by it and they would just break the legs of an individual who was on there or thrust a spear into their heart to kill them. But the, the cross, it was horrible. Cicero goes on to even talk about what his, I mean, he doesn't hide any emotions about what he thinks about the cross. He writes this, It is a crime to bind a Roman citizen, to scourge him a wickedness, to put him to death as almost parasite. But what shall I say of crucifying him? So guilty an action cannot by any possibility be adequately expressed by any name bad enough for it. Yet this was the punishment for God, Jesus, who came and lived for a period of time, divinity cloaked in humanity, and this was the death that he suffered. It's prophesied throughout the different places in the Old Testament, and specifically I want to look at today for a moment Isaiah 53. It's very fascinating, very accurate. This is the death. This horrible, painful, embarrassing, shameful death that was reserved for the hardest criminals in the Roman period. Jesus was crucified with two other criminals, and there he was, the spotless, sinless, perfect, loving Son of God. How could you crucify someone who went about doing good things? Healing, preaching, giving comfort, offering life, and just an abundance of love that just flowed from him. 
yet it was the people, as you'll see, the Sadducees, the Pharisees, the religious rulers of the day that were very threatened by Christ, and they ultimately said, crucify him. So let's go to the prophecy and the actual event, but before we do that, I want to tell you, here, just show you here, you can find much of what we're going to talk about today in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and here are the particular chapters that you would find. I would recommend you pick one. Now, you'll notice that Matthew, Mark, and Luke, they do it in a couple chapters. John is the most elongated because there's a lot more in there as well. I'd also like to recommend a couple different things to you. One is the ESV Reader's Gospel. It's awesome. It's printed on nice paper, has no chapters or verses. It just reads right through. The other one that I find completely fascinating is done by CSB. It's the Chronological Gospel, and you can pick up and, and it will merge all four Gospels together, and you can read this whole account of the crucifixion. But let's go to the prophecy, and then we're going to flip to the actual event that took place that corresponds with that prophecy. We start in Isaiah 53, verse 3. He was despised and rejected by men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief, and as one from whom men hide their faces, he was despised and we esteemed him not. So there we have the, in, the initial prophecy, Isaiah 53. Now let's go over into the Gospels and see the account that would best correspond to that prophecy. Mark 15. And the soldiers led him away inside the palace, that is the governor's headquarters, and they called together the whole battalion, and they clothed him in a purple cloak, and twisting together a crown of thorns, they put it on him, and they began to salute him. Christ, the perfect, sinless human being, he was mocked, tortured, spit on, beaten for us. Next we go back to Isaiah. Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows, yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God, and afflicted. Now we go to Luke and see the fruition of this prophecy. And as they led him away, they seized one Simon of Cyrene, who was coming in from the country, and laid on him the cross to carry it behind Jesus. And there followed him a great multitude of people and of women who were mourning and lamenting for him. We continue on with Isaiah 53, verse 5. But he was pierced for our transgressions, he was crushed for our iniquities, upon him was the chastisement that brought us peace, and with his wounds we are healed. Now we go to the actual physical aspect of the crucifixion as it took place and accounted by John. So they took Jesus, and he went out bearing his own cross to the place called the place of a skull, which in Aramaic is Golgotha. There they crucified him, and with him two others, one on either side, and Jesus between them. As the account goes, he was pierced in his hands, more than likely his wrists, about right here, and his feet. Left there to die. Normally, again, it would have been a very cruel death that would have been agonizing over days, but within a matter of hours, he was gone. Broken, crucified for us. All right, back to Isaiah 53. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned every one to his own way, and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. Now, we go to this account here in Mark. Others have it too, but Mark really lays it out. And this, this soul-rending despair that Christ, the Son of God, God himself, in the flesh, the separation he's feeling, the separation that comes from sin, because he's bearing the sin of the whole world. When the sixth hour had come, there was darkness over the whole land until the ninth hour. And at the ninth hour, Jesus cried out with a loud voice, Eloi, Eloi, lima sabachthani, which means, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? I can't imagine being Jesus' mother Mary and listening to that. But here was the separation, we'll talk more about it here in a second, of the, of the Son of God being separated by sin. All right, back to Isaiah 53. He was oppressed and he was afflicted, that he opened not his mouth like a lamb that is led to the slaughter, and like a sheep that before it shears is silence, so he opened not his mouth. Our human tendency, if we've been wrongfully accused, is to speak out. But Jesus, perfect, sinless, guiltless, what did he do? We read the account here. And Mark and the chief priests accused him of many things, and Pilate again asked him, Have you no answer to make? See how many charges they bring against you. But Jesus made no further answer, so that Pilate was amazed. Love. Mm. Love exemplified. Back to Isaiah 53. By oppression and judgment he was taken away, and as for his generation, who considered that he was cut off from the land of the living, 
stricken for the transgressions of my people. We see the fruition of this prophecy here written as John did. Now it was a day of preparation for the Passover. It was about the sixth hour. He said to the Jews, Behold your king. That was Pilate. They cried out, Away with him, away with him, crucify him. Pilate said to them, Shall I crucify your king? The chief priest answered, We have no king but Caesar. At that moment, that's when they were pushing off God and the rule and the love that God had for them. They were pushing it aside, cutting him off. Okay, back to Isaiah 53. And they made his grave with the wicked and with the rich man in his death, although he had done no violence and there was no deceit in his mouth. We now go to Luke, who was very detailed in his report to uh, Theopolis. And this is what he reported. Now, there was a man named Joseph from the Jewish town of Arimathea. He was a member of the council, a good and righteous man, who had not consented to the decision and action, and he was looking for the kingdom of God. This man went to Pilate and asked for the body of Jesus. Then he took it down, wrapped it in a linen shroud, and laid him in a tomb cut in stone where no one had yet been laid. Now, under normal circumstances, for anybody else, that would be the end of the story. <laughs> but there's one more prophecy, and that is good news. Now, I went, here's the picture of it, a few months ago, I got to see what they believe is the tomb that Jesus was laid in, the garden tomb. And the good news is it's empty, and it goes right along with the prophecy that we see in Isaiah 53. Yet it was the will of the Lord to crush him. He had put him to grief when his soul makes an offering for guilt. He shall see his offspring. He shall prolong his days. The will of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. He's risen. How do we know? Well, we have this one account of, the, uh, of three others in the Gospels. But on the first day of the week, at early dawn, they went to the tomb, taking the spices they had prepared. These are the women who were going back to visit. And they found the stone rolled away from the tomb, but when they went in, they did not find the body of the Lord Jesus. While they were perplexed about this, behold, two men stood by them in dazzling apparel. And as they were frightened and bowed their faces to the ground, the men said to them, Why do you seek the living among the dead? He is not here. He has risen. Oh, oh. Yes. What a great finale. What a great conclusion of the prophecies. Now, there are others in the book of Isaiah and the book of Psalms and throughout the Old Testament that speak not only of Christ in general, but also of his, of his crucifixion and the, the way he would be treated. But we have this account. We see it, right? And we ask the specific question, why did Christ have to die? You want the short answer or the long answer? Okay, I'll give you the short answer first. Love. Yep. Oh, there's one other one. You. Me too, but love for you and me and all humanity. Now you want the long answer? All right. Well, we'll get into that. This is a little bit longer and a little more detailed, but I think it helps bridge what we've talked about over the last three sessions, brings it together into one, and lets us get a more definitive idea about why Christ died what the purpose was, why he chose to do it, and what it means to you and I. We, we have to for, for, first realize that the Bible, again, is the story of a covenant. It's a, it's a promise between God and the creation, creator and created, that he will love and do whatever it takes. So let's just review that real quickly, this account that the covenant is basic to Scripture. It's not simply the concept of covenant, but the concrete existence of God's covenantal dealings in our history that provides the context within which we recognize the unity of Scripture amid its remarkable variety. Remember, 40 authors, 66 books, over 1,600 years, and they all speak of God's covenant. That's where we start. And really, that's where we're going to end, because that's what this whole thing is about. It's about the covenant. How do you sum it up? They shall be my people, and I will be their God. And remembering, this covenant was put into place before creation, before Jesus even got down on his knees and formed Adam and Eve, he had already made a covenant and a choice. We see it here in Ephesians. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places, even as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and blameless before him. In love, he predestined us for adoption to himself as sons through Jesus Christ, according to the purpose of his will. Why would Jesus do this? Simple. We were irretrievably lost because of sin. There was nothing. Once Adam and Eve fell, well, let's go back to get the Garden of Eden just to look at this, just so we give it some 
some concrete proof. The Lord God took the man, found in chapter 2, and put him in the Garden of Eden to work it and keep it. And the Lord God commanded the man, saying, You may surely eat of every tree of the garden, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat, for in the day that you eat of it you shall surely die. Adam and Eve didn't die immediately, but the process began. And the process would lead to eternal death and separation from God. They started to experience it first when God killed the actual animals to make skins for them. And then as they left the Garden of Eden and they would watch the seasons, they would see the leaves change and animals die and all the other processes of death. But ultimately, death is the result of separation and pulling away from God by disobedience and pulling away from God's law. But our iniquities did that to us. Our sin and our choices did that to us. Let me reinforce that in what Isaiah says. But your iniquities have made a separation between you and your God, and your sins have hidden his face from you so that he does not hear. Notice it doesn't say his punishment or his wrath or anything in that particular. It says our sin. It was our choice, which is kind of unusual in this day and age to take responsibility for things, but really, in the light of sin and the way that God and we exist, God continues to love, but our sin takes us and pulls us away as a natural separation. Death, eternal death, is the final result. Paul reminds us that everyone has sinned. The wages of sin is death. And unless you look around and think somebody else might be better than you, keep this in mind. Everybody has sinned. Me, you, there's not one person who's lived except Christ who has not sinned. We go back to Romans and we see this. Therefore, just as sin came into the world through one man, death through sin... So death spread to all men because we all have sinned. And that should be the end of it. Death. Eternal separation from God. A willful choice by human beings when they say, you know what, I don't want to follow what God wants me to do. I want to choose my own path. Separation and death becomes the ultimate result. And it's a death that is permanent. It is an eternal death. How eternal is it? 2 Thessalonians 1 9, they will suffer the punishment of eternal destruction away from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of his might. And that should have been the end of it. Death and eternal separation from God. Period. But that's not how God wrote the end of the story. Now I have shared with you today and through other sessions a text from Romans that Paul said, the wages of sin is death. But I have forgotten, kind of deliberately, to give you the rest of the text. And maybe it'll flip everything for you. The wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life. You see, God wouldn't let eternal separation be the end of the discussion. He wasn't going to let love die just like that. He wasn't going to let Satan win quite that easy. He set into motion, there we see in the Garden of Eden, this plan that he had already enacted before the creation. How do we know? We go to Titus. In hope of eternal life, which God, who never lies, promised before the ages began. Uh, Let me pose this question for you. What would you do if you knew that the very thing you created might actually kill you? Would you do it? You knew it was going to reject you as a possibility. And you might actually have to give your life to save it, would you? I'm human, you're human. I wouldn't. If I knew that the potential, we love our life too much, if I knew the potential was there that the thing I created would take my life, not God, God says, well, my love is too great, too much, too strong, will pursue for eternity, that I must take the chance, must give them freedom of choice. The very people he created didn't even know who he was, and they took his life. But this plan, it was enacted immediately upon Adam and Eve's fall in the garden. We see this testimony right here in Genesis. I will put enmity between you, the serpent Satan, and the woman, and between your offspring and her offspring. He shall bruise your head, and you shall bruise his heel. It it wasn't a reactive plan. It was a proactive plan that had already been done. And throughout the Old Testament, we see this system put into place that points to Jesus coming as this perfect example that was going to live for us and then die to redeem us. We get the first glimpse of this sacrificial system, this type that has been put into place as we look in the book of Genesis. Here we consider Adam and Eve. They've had two sons, and we hear the story about what they've done. Adam knew Eve, and she conceived and bore Cain, saying, I have gotten a man with the help of the Lord. And again, she bore his brother Abel. Now Abel was the keeper of sheep, and Cain a worker of the ground. In the course of time, Cain brought to the Lord an offering of the fruit of the ground, and Abel also brought of the firstborn of his flock and of the fat portions. 
And the Lord had regard for Abel and his offering, but for Cain and his offering he had no regard. Abel brought from the flock the sheep that he was supposed to, the perfect lamb that was brought and given as a sacrifice. Cain chose his own sacrifice. That's a whole other session in itself. But here was Abel, and he was murdered for the choice that he made. God said, as he set everything up, there's going to be a lamb who's going to come and redeem the world. But until that point, I'm going to give you a system that will remind you and let you think about the consequences of sin. We see it even more in depth as it's been set up in the sanctuary system and the temple system when the Israelites came out of Egypt and went, were headed to the promised land. Here we get a better idea of it in the book of Leviticus. If his offering is a burnt offering from the herd, he shall offer a male without blemish. He shall bring it to the entrance of the tent of meeting, that he may be accepted before the Lord. He shall lay his hand on the head of the burnt offering, and it shall be accepted for him to make atonement for him. Imagine, you live in the Israelite time. You have committed a sin. You would go to your flock, get the best lamb. You would grab it, take it down to the tabernacle, visit with the priest, put your hand on the head of the lamb, watch the throat being slit and the life poured out. And this was the type of representing Christ who was to come and be the perfect lamb. And then every year, they would also have the Day of Atonement, the most important day on the Jewish calendar. And here was the representation of Christ, this at one man, bringing and merging together God and the human race. This Day of Atonement, all pointing forward to Jesus. It's why John was able to say with such accuracy and such volume and prophetic word. The next day he saw Jesus coming, this John the Baptist, and he said, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Not only was he the Lamb of God who took away the sin of the world, he was slain before the foundation of the world, which we find in Revelation. All inhabitants of the earth will worship the beast, all whose name have not been written in the Lamb's book of life, the Lamb who was slain from the creation of the world. Jesus was committed to being the Redeemer of those he created. I mean, you look through the prophecy of the Old Testament, you look at the, at the type uh, of the Lamb and the Day of Atonement and all the blood and the sacrifices that were done. They weren't just done just so God could have them go, walk through some ritual just for fun. They were done to point to Jesus so they could see that there was a Redeemer that was coming. The Old Testament is pointing to the Redeemer. The New Testament and on is a reflection of the Redeemer. God's amazing system was pointing to Jesus, the Redeemer. The one who created would also redeem. But again, why? Why be the Redeemer? Why would he do this? What kind of love would drive God to do what he was willing to do, to give his own life? I think there's a story in the Old Testament. It's, it's a unique story, but it to me, as I share it with you and we reflect on it, to me, I think it just gives a best example of God's amazing love and what he's willing to do, what his part is in the covenant, what our part is, what he can do, what we cannot do. So we go to Genesis. It's a, it's a very fascinating story. We started in Genesis 12. It's the story of Abram, and this is his initial call coming out of Ur of the Chaldees. The Lord said to Abram, Go from your country and your kindred and your father's house to the land I will show you, and I will make of you a great nation, and I will bless you and make your name great so that you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you, and him who dishonors you I will curse, and in you all the families of the earth shall be blessed. So Abram and Sarai and Lot and the rest of the family, they leave Ur the Chaldees where they're familiar with, they know everybody, and they start wandering. Now Ur the Chaldees is kind of in the area where Iraq is. They start moving as God directs them, and eventually God brings them to what would be present-day Israel, Palestine area. Time goes by, and... Abram, who would eventually become Abraham, he's reflecting on this promise because God has said, I'm going to do something with you. And Abram's waiting to see, well, is this really going to happen? We take our next stop and we go to Genesis 13. The Lord said to Abram, after Lot had separated from him, lift up your eyes and look from the place where you are, northward and southward, eastward and westward, for all the land that you see I will give to you and to your offspring forever. I will make your offspring as the dust of the earth, so that if one can count the dust of the earth, your offspring also can be counted. Arise, walk through the length and the breadth of the land, for I will give it to you. God makes this amazing promise to Abram. But Abram, he's kind of scratching his head, saying, Okay, I know God said it, but here's the problem. I don't have any kids. He's over 75 years old. He and Sarai, they have no kids. And typically, if you're going to have offspring that are going to take over the earth, you need to start with at least one. So Abram's starting to question God. 
And this is where we move a little bit further into the story. And we find how God answers Abram in this amazing aspect of a covenant. Going to Genesis 15. After these things, the word of the Lord came to Abram in a vision. Fear not, Abram, I am your shield. Your reward shall be very great. But Abram said, O Lord God, what will you give me? For I continue childless, and the heir of my house is Eliezer of Damascus. And Abram said, Behold, you have given me no offspring, and a member of my household will be my heir. And behold, the word of the Lord came to him, This man shall not be your heir, but your own son shall be your heir. And he brought him outside and said, Look toward heaven and number the stars, if you are able to number them. Then he said to him, So shall your offspring be. And he, Abraham, believed the Lord, and he counted to him as righteousness. He said to him, that's God, I am the Lord who brought you out of Ur of the Chaldeans to give you this land to possess. But he said, O Lord God, how am I to know that I shall possess it? Now, doubt is a natural human inclination. I know you said it, God, but how do I know? Because I'm not seeing yet the promise that you made coming to fruition. Uh, Abram is no different than you and I, I suspect, in that regard. Because again, he's saying, I know that you told me that you're going to make a promise, but we've got one problem. I don't have any kids. But God's telling him and affirming, it will come from you. My promise will come to fruition. Then something very interesting and unique happens. It begins the process of what we call cutting the covenant. He said to him, bring me a heifer three years old, a female goat three years old, a ram three years old, a turtle dove, and a young pigeon. And he brought him all these, cut them in half, and laid each half over against the other. But he did not cut the birds in half. And when birds of prey came down on the carcasses, Abram drove them away. As the sun was going down, a deep sleep fell on Abram, and behold, dreadful and great darkness fell upon him. When the sun had gone down and it was dark, behold, a smoking fire pot and flaming torch passed between these pieces. On that day, the Lord made a covenant with Abram, saying, To your offspring I give this land, from the river of Egypt to the great river, the river Euphrates. This, this fits right along with, with any covenant custom from that time period. Hittites used it, others used it, that's been verified. The two parties would take the animals, they would cut them in half, and they, both parties would walk in between to seal the covenant, sign on the dotted line, so to speak. And what they were saying is, if I break the covenant, may what happened to these animals also happen to me. But I want you to notice something very unique. Who walked through? It's represented in the burning torch and the flaming pot that was God's presence. We see also God's presence later on with the Israelites in the wilderness as a flaming fire and a cloud. But who went through? It was God. What about Abraham? Or Abram as he's known there. He did nothing. God made the covenant with himself and he expected nothing from Abram in return on that covenant. Absolutely nothing. Because he knew there was nothing that Abram could bring and do that would make that covenant fulfilled. So God said, I will make a covenant with myself to you that what I've said I will do, I will actually complete. And that's the full covenant that God has made for this planet, for all humanity. He knew that we cannot do that which he needed to do for us. When Adam and Eve chose to disobey, when they chose the fruit of that tree and disobeyed everything that God had said to them out of love and grace from the eternal law of love from his throne, and they disobeyed, they said, well, okay, Satan, you're right. God's holding on to us, we're going to follow God knew there was nothing that we could do as humans, absolutely nothing, and that he needed to do it. So we see in this story, this amazing story, unique, different, God cutting the covenant with Abram, and he's taking all the responsibility on the covenant to himself. And really, what does it mean? Isaiah 54 it bears repeating it once more. God is saying, for the mountains may depart and the hills be removed, but my steadfast love shall not depart from you, and my covenant of peace shall not be removed, says the Lord, who has compassion on you. The mountains disappear. His creation disappeared before his love quits. I'm speechless sometimes when I think about the amazing love of God. He'd rather choose to be cut off than to lose you, to lose me. And he was cut off, cut off in a very significant way. We see kind of an idea about this in Philippians. This is speaking about Jesus as Philippians is being written by Paul. He's writing to the church there, and he's talking to them about Christ and what he gave up when he became humanity for us. Have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus, who, though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself by taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men, 
And being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Do you know what Paul is trying to communicate here? All the rights and privileges that come from being God, part of the Trinity, Jesus was willing to lay down so that he could live a life just like we would, just like we do. If Satan had witnessed Jesus doing anything that we didn't have access to that he had as divinity, he would have said, well, they can't do that, so therefore your sacrifice doesn't work. Your life that you lived in the sinless manner, it doesn't count because you had access to things that they don't have. So Jesus cut himself off from the, the rights and privileges. Not only that, as we go back and revisit the statement from Mark, we recognize that that, that cutting off also took place in his relationship and the way he felt as he was on the cross when he poured out this incredibly painful terms. And I'm not going to read the whole text to you, but look at the look at the last part. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? He was cut off from the Trinity, from the Father and the Holy Spirit. But again, I ask you why. He loves you. And he'd rather die than spend eternity without you, without me, with all, all the people that have ever lived, have lived, are living now, or will ever live. It's what love does. I mean, he doesn't know how to do it any differently. This is love personified. Love, the eternal law of love in heaven and the government of heaven is love. God is love. And we see on the cross, in this beautiful statement I'm going to read to you from this amazing book, Desire of Ages, we see that love is selfless. Love cannot bear to see another person suffer and lose something when they can do something to keep that from happening. And Jesus recognized before he even created this planet, I'm going to have to come down and I'm going to have to redeem them if they make a wrong choice. But I'd rather do that than lose them. Amazing love. Now, this book that I referred to, Desire of Ages, Library of Congress, says it's probably the most impactful book on the life of Christ. And the author writes very succinctly, it will be seen that the glory shining in the face of Jesus is the glory of self-sacrificing love. In the light from Calvary, it will be seen that the law of self-renouncing love is the law of life for earth and heaven, that the love which seeks not our own has its source in the heart of God, and that in the meek and lowly one is manifested the character of him who dwells in the light which no man can approach unto. But here the author, what they're saying is, in Christ on Calvary, we see love personified, love exemplified, love demonstrated, self-sacrificing love. This is the whole law, as Jesus said, summed up love. The eternal principles of God's kingdom are love, selfless love, saying, I'd rather give my life so that you can have yours than to keep mine and you lose yours. Not only that, when Christ died, he uttered three very impactful words we find in the book of John, and they are so packed with meaning. Going to John 19, when Jesus had received the sour wine, he said, It is finished. And he bowed his head and he gave up his life. So what's finished? Sin no longer has to exist in a person's life. Satan no longer has dominion over this world. Death is defeated because he came and resurrected from the grave. Everything is finished. The plan that was put into place before the foundation of the world, finished. The covenant, finished and sealed. Everything that had been planned for on the behalf of humanity, behalf of you and me, is finished. Jesus did it with his death and his resurrection. And eternal life, it's ours. It's ours right now. It is finished. What a powerful statement. It is finished. Well, the author that I shared earlier, Desire of Ages, let me just give you what they say regarding this statement, it is finished. Well then might the angels rejoice as they looked upon the Savior's cross, for though they did not then understand all, they knew that the destruction of sin and Satan was forever made certain, the redemption of man was assured, and the universe was made eternally secure. Christ himself fully comprehended the result of the sacrifice made upon Calvary. To all these he looked forward when upon the cross he cried out, It is finished. He may have said it is finished, but for you and I, and for every person that's ever lived, it's just begun. Everything that we have lost is ours to gain through Christ. I've got to give you the good news as we wrap this up. Stop in Hebrews. For with the blood of goats and bulls and the sprinkling of defiled persons with the ashes of a heifer, which is representing the Old Testament sacrifices, sanctified for the purification of the flesh, 
how much more will the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without blemish to God, purify our conscience from dead works to serve the living God? We were eternally separated, no hope, nothing. God turned it around. Jesus turned it around by his death on the cross. It is finished for Satan. It is finished for death. It is finished for sin. It has just begun for the life that you and I want to live. Oh, this is great news. Going on, 1 Peter 2.24 he himself, Jesus, bore our sins in his body on the tree that we might die to sin and live to righteousness. By his wounds, you have been healed. Just like in that story we talked about God and, and Abram in the covenant, it was God who went through the animals. Abram did nothing. You and I, we can do nothing. God said, I'll do it all. And he gave his life on the cross to give us eternal life, expecting that he knew we can do nothing. I can't earn it. I can't buy it. I can do nothing. Neither can you. He gave it willingly. He gave it freely so that you could have a changed life. Conquering sin. Be able to live forever and experience eternity with God. This is amazing news. All right, we go on. Romans 5, 8. For one will scarcely die for a righteous person, though perhaps for a good person one would dare even to die. But God shows his love for us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. That's amazing news. I'm a sinner. You're a sinner. There's nothing we can do. While we're in our current state, he died. We're human. We tend to not give things to people unless we think they've deserved it. Or we give a good gift to someone we love and we care about. You know, as long as we're not mad at them. But even though we were separated by sin, Satan was the accuser of the brethren, so to speak, saying, you don't want to do that for them. Jesus said, I'll give my life for them. They don't have to earn it. The my merits, my word, my keeping the covenant, I will do that for them. And everyone has sinned. There's not one person immune. All of us have sinned. All of us need a Savior. Romans tells us very clearly, for there is no distinction. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God and are justified by his grace as a gift through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. I, 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 I share this with you, and I've, I've been a Christian all my life. But I will tell you, I still get emotional when I when I talk about it. When I look at my life before God, before I really understood redemption and salvation and love Jesus had for me, and I look at my life now, I don't want it any other way. And I hope that it's conveyed to you. It's free. It's a gift. He loves you. He gave everything for you because he couldn't imagine living life without you. Okay, we're almost done. First Corinthians, Paul's writing, for as by a man came death, by a man has also come the resurrection of the dead. For as in Adam all die, so also in Christ shall all be made alive. Remember we talked the last session. The first Adam was the Son of God. The second Adam, Jesus, the Son of God. Jesus came to do what the original Adam couldn't do. To live sinless. To be obedient. To live a life of love. Cherishing God's word and fulfilling the covenant. Adam couldn't do it, but Jesus could. It's the covenant that Jesus was trying to bring back together again, to make whole. I spoke about that. Love full circle, a completed loop, brought together by Christ's death on the cross as he stretched out his arms on the cross. He brought wholeness to humanity. Those who are lost can be found. Those who are dead in sins can be made alive. Those who feel guilty can be set free. The shame that you and I feel, gone. Satan can say whatever he wants. All we have to do is look to point to the cross and say, Jesus did it. You can say all you want, Satan, but I look to Jesus. He's waiting to connect you to eternal life. He's waiting to forgive you, to redeem you. He wants to give it to you. It's a gift. As we, as we share the final text, this is, a again, a paraphrase from Ty Gibson. I'd shared it in the last session, but I just want to reaffirm it because then it brings this whole session together. The covenant, the sacrifice, love, all brought together in unity. For it's God living out love, out of the law, out of his character for each one of us, giving us the hope and the peace and the, and the freedom that we would never have without him. We'd be destined to just eternal separation. But God said, I couldn't do it. I cannot live without you. And Ty Gibson's paraphrase helps cinch it up one more time. God so loved, with covenant faithfulness, the whole world, both Jews and Gentiles, that he gave to the whole world his only begotten son of promise to demonstrate what true sonship looks like 
so that whoever believes in him as God's faithful son and is born through him into true sonship should not perish under the covenant curses, but have everlasting life under the covenant blessings. I want you to hear a key word, believe. To all who believe. Notice you don't have to do something. You don't have to run through hoops or live a certain way or do a certain thing or pay, pay a certain price. To all who believe. Now there's a lot that comes with that word believe, but Jesus is saying to all who believe, eternal life is theirs. And you can say, well, I'm not, I'm, I'm not good enough. I can't do it. Well, I, I share this with you from Isaiah. Behold, the Lord's hand is not shortened, that it cannot save, or his ear dull, that it cannot hear. doesn't matter how bad you think you are or how bad you really are. He can save you. Just believe. That's it. And then there'll be a life change that comes from that belief. Oh, he loves you. He loves me. He loves all humanity. I love this text found in Zephaniah. The Lord your God is in your midst, mighty one who will save. He will rejoice over you with gladness. He will quiet you by his love. He will exalt over you with loud singing. True story, a number of years ago, a lady sent her son off to college, and he came back after a few months, and he had become a skeptic, almost an atheist. And They were sitting down having breakfast, and they were talking, and he said, I don't believe in God anymore. Said, Why not? Why don't you believe in him? He said, he doesn't care about me. He doesn't care about you. He looked at his mother, and I, I wouldn't say this to my mother, but he said to her, do you realize that you, that you're worthless, that you're meaning, you don't mean anything in the scope of the universe and eternity. You're nothing. What does it matter about you? Why would he care about you? And the mother, she sat there and she thought about it for a minute and tears started to come down her cheek. She looked down at the table and she looked up at her son and she said, you're right. In the scheme of eternity and the universe, I'm nothing. And you're nothing either. But God's reputation, it's everything. And he promised to live out the covenant to save us. And if he didn't, his reputation would be ruined for eternity. And that's why I put my hope in him. Not because of what I can do, but because of what he said he would do. And that's what it's all about. God made a promise, made a covenant that he would give his unending, eternal, everlasting love to humanity. That he would do whatever it took to save me, to save you, and to save all who would believe. And this incredible gift, this is why Pascal says, make a wager on God. What do you got to lose? And I think you realize now, if you choose to believe, that when you make a wager on God, there's absolutely zero that you'll lose and everything to gain.